Okay, so a few minutes late, let's start. Um, we are very happy to have Christophe Garbin and uh, he will speak about uh, symmetry breaking along the Nishimori line, which uh, he will explain because we don't know what it is. So <laughs> well, I don't know. Okay, so thank you, Christophe. Lot, thanks a lot, Ariel, for the, for the invitation. So indeed, I will tell you about uh, so th there will be a mix of two things, uh, continuous symmetry breaking for, uh, for uh, spin systems in ZD. I will introduce uh, these. And uh, this Nishimori line, which is something that uh, has to do with a certain quench disorder for, uh, for uh, spin systems and uh, is, is a bit related to Bayesian statistics. So I will introduce all these concepts later. And uh, it's a joint work with a, with uh, Tom Spencer, and uh, and this is thanks to the first lockdown. Uh, I think without this long lockdown, I would not have the chance to interact with him. Okay, so so let me start with a uh, with a uh, with a uh, briefly introducing uh, classical spin systems with a special focus on uh, spin systems that have a, a continuous symmetry group. Um, but I will at least state one system uh, which, which has a discrete symmetry group, which will be the easing model. And uh, all these spin systems, they will live on the, on the vertices of a lattice. So here uh, I've drawn Z2, but think of ZD in general, the dimension D will play a, an important role. And so each vertex will carry a spin, which I will uh, almost always denote sigma X or sometimes UX later. And this spin will take values in different uh, possible spaces. And in the case of easing, spins take their values in a plus or minus one. And, uh, and uh, on the space of configuration, a sigma in plus minus one to the a big box of ZD, or it can even be defined on the full lattice. Uh, but if on a finite box, a configuration will carry a weight, a Boltzmann weight, which will be proportional to this exponential beta times the sum of our nearest neighbors, sigma i times sigma j. And uh, you've probably heard uh, many times about this, but uh, just in case, uh, it means that when beta is huge, beta is called the inverse temperature. When beta is huge, this quality measure, which is also called the Gibbs measure, will favor the configurations which will tend to be aligned. Uh, sigma i wants to be equal to its neighbor, sigma j, and so on. So this is why beta large is like low temperature because the system will not be much disordered. And then those three examples here are instances of uh, spin systems that have an underlying uh, continuous symmetry group. And the first in the line is the, the XY model where the spins at, at each vertex of ZD uh, belong to the unit circle S1. And, um, and the Hamiltonian, the, the Gibbs measure is the same as before. It's still sum over neighboring sites, I here, J here, all the, all the edges of ZD. And uh, the interaction between two neighboring spins will be the cosine of theta I minus theta J, or if you prefer the scalar product of sigma I times uh, sigma J at that site. So again, in this case, the effect of the inverse temperature beta when it is large, will make the system in such a way that it will kind of align, they will point to the same direction, but now uh, there is not a, a discrete symmetry. So you will have a small fluctuation, continuous fluctuation at, at, at all the points. So here the, 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 the symmetry group is a, is a SO2. So the rotations preserve the, the Hamiltonians here. If you rotate each of the angle by an angle alpha, it cancels out here and you preserve the, the Gibbs measure. The second model with a continuous symmetry group that I want to, to tell you about is the Eisenberg model. It's called the classical Eisenberg because there is a quantum Eisenberg model that also lives on a lattice, which is related to this one. And in the case of the classical Eisenberg model, the, the spins uh, belong to the unit sphere S2. So it's almost like the XY model. The Hamiltonian is the same. It's the sum of the nearest neighbor vertices of the scalar product. Again, spins want to align in the same direction, but it turns out that uh, the, the phenomenology for this system is very different, at least in dimension two from this system here. So 
yeah, may, maybe I'll give a, a few uh, important results in, in a second. And the, the last model I want to, to tell you about is, a, is, a, is, is, is my last model with continuous symmetry. Now, each vertex in, in ZD, each point X in ZD will carry a group element UX, which will belong to a, a Lie group G, a Lie group a matrix value Lie group. For example, think of SU2. And now the Gibbs measure is a little bit like before. I'm summing over the neighboring uh, vertices i and j. And I take the trace of u i star u j. And I take the real part if the, the, the complex group, if the Lie group is a complex value. So all these models, they favor uh, configurations that point to the uh, same direction, plus eventually some small fluctuations. I have a picture here of two of these. So this would be the easing model on the left um, at a temperature which would be close to the critical point. And here you would have an instance of an XY model at a relatively low temperature. So this would be an archetypal of discrete symmetry. And there is an underlying symmetry group here, which is the SO2. And uh, let me say a few uh, important theorems here. So, so in the case of the XY model, it's known that when the dimension D is greater or equal to three, there is long range order. So what this means is that um, when, when you are on Z3 and the temperature is low enough, if beta is large enough, indeed the spins will, will, will tend to pick one direction and will fluctuate a little bit around that uh, direction, which will go to, I mean, there is order all the way to infinity. While at high temperature, it's easy to, to prove that there is a exponential decay of correlation. In dimension two, and I, I do like a lot the dimension two, it's known since the 60s that all of these models do not have any long range order whatsoever. This is an argument which is due to Mermin and Wagner, uh, which uses uh, spin wave interpolations, but I will not go uh, much into it. Um, so physicists knew from the 60s that uh, nothing interesting happened for any of these models. But in the 70s, uh, Kosterlitz, Berzinski, and Taules, they understood that this model, even though it never had any uh, long range order at whatever temperature except the really zero temperature, this one still had a, 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 a beautiful phase transition, which is now called the BKT phase transition. And at low temperature, it has a polynomial decay of correlation. And high temperature, it has exponential decay of correlation. And the conjecture is, in some sense, that uh, uh, systems with continuous symmetry will have this phase transition only if they have a abelian underlying symmetry group. And these, these cases here do not have an abelian uh, symmetry group. And it's conjectures that, uh, that they have exponential decay of correlation all the way to the zero temperature. And let me also say, Ron is not, uh, he, he has this uh, urgent meeting, but uh, a Mr. month ago. I'm here. Ah, I... you are here. Okay, so I can insist even more then. So uh, a month ago, there were two uh, um, impressive works uh, the same day on archive, uh, one by uh, uh, Eisenman, uh, Ron, uh, Matanarel, and Shapiro uh, on the Villain model, and the other one by, uh, by Lise and uh, Von Engelenburg. And they give uh, new proofs uh, of this uh, phase transition for these two models, which have a more geometric flavor. So, so there is a, a new understanding of this, which is, which is very nice. And uh, OK, so, so in this talk, uh, there will be nothing about dimension d equals 2, so nothing about uh, uh, Bayeski, Corsales, Taules. The, the whole focus will be on this uh, property of long range order when, uh, when, when, when dimension is greater or equal to three. And, um, and the thing I want to emphasize at this point is that when you have a discrete symmetry group, for example, this, then there is a rather easy way to detect long range order when the temperature is low. And the, this is using what's called the payers argument. So the, the idea is to is to spot interfaces uh, from a phase plus to another phase minus, and to quantify the fact that uh, large interfaces are very costly 
in terms of energy. And so at low temperature, you don't want to have such large interfaces. And the absence of such large interfaces prevents the system from forgetting about its state at infinity. So this combinatorial type of argument, which focuses on number of interfaces and energy cost of these interfaces, that doesn't exist in, for any continuous symmetry groups. You cannot take a XY model or classical Eisenberg model in S2 and try to look for an interface somewhere that would have a certain phase outside and another phase inside. Things can move continuously with a little bit of fluctuations. And so all those pairs arguments, they're completely inefficient to detect long range order. So you may wonder how come one detects anything like that? And in some sense, the only tool uh, that is known so far, uh, besides a, a long series of work by uh, Balaban in the 80s, which is highly non-trivial and um, which goes through a renormalization group, the only tool which uh, sort of bypasses the renormalization group is called the reflection positivity. And this was uh, done by Frölich, Simon Spencer in 1976. And um, I think since then, besides this uh, other way by Balaban, there is nothing known to detect a uh, uh, long range order when the spin system has a, a symmetry group. So when it is abelian, I should stress that if you take XY model on Z3, there is another way to detect long range order, which also uses tools that can be used for the BKT phase transition. But if you take an Eisenberg model or a Lie group valued model like that, uh, there is basically only reflection positivity. So reflection positivity, I will not introduce much what it is, but it, uh, it, it, it needs to be applied on a, on a graph which has lots of symmetries. Typically, this is always on a high dimensional torus or three dimensional torus. And also the, the, the the coupling constants, they need to satisfy some symmetry conditions. So when you want to detect long range order for those systems, you're forced to work in a very finite and highly symmetric system and with certain uh, prescribed uh, coupling constants that, uh, that, 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 uh, that code your, your interaction between the speed. And the goal of this talk will be to give a a different way of detecting long range order, which will be in some ways um, uh, less restrictive than this one. We, we will be able to handle many types of graphs. It will also have its own restrictions. So it will, it will need an, a, a quench disorder. So it will not work exactly on those graphs. There will be a bit of quench disorder, but as beta will go to infinity, the quench disorder will almost disappear. So. I'll introduce the results later, but the point will be to give a completely different way to detect those uh, long range order when the symmetry group is still non abelian, continuous, or whatever you want. So I will slowly uh, uh, start to introduce what is the type of quench disorder that we will have. It will always be a disorder that will live on the edges. And the quench disorder will be independent on one edge from another. So the, the randomness from the quench disorder is an AID field on the edges of ZD. And I start with the, the easing model because it's probably easier to picture. So I will still have a, an Hamiltonian, a Gibbs measure as the one that I had before, but on each edge, I neighboring J, I will also have uh, an additional ran random coupling constant, JIJ. Notations are not uh, so well chosen to pronounce. And um, these random coupling constants will be plus one with priority P, minus one with priority one minus P. So in this graph, which I've stolen from, uh, I think the paper of Nishimori in 1981 is the first one who started the, to, to look at those things. Uh, P increases on this axis all the way to P equals one. And then on this axis, there is the temperature. So when P is equal to one, JIJ is always equal to one. So this model is the same as the one I had before. There is no disorder here. It's just the classical easing model. And so along this axis, this is the classical easing model in dimension D. And by Payer's argument and monotonicity, it is known that there is a critical point at some point below which there is long range order 
and above which there is exponential decay. But now if we start going to this part of the phase diagram, P is getting smaller. So we start putting uh, some uh, disordered bonds. And uh, it was pro proven by Origoshi and Morita in 1982 that if P is rather large, if there are few such edges, then you still have a ferromagnetic phase. It means you still have long range order. There are not sufficiently many minus edges to ruin the order uh, at long distances. And when P gets smaller and smaller, then uh, this is meant at being the, the edges that are equal to minus. You will create more and more frustrations in your system. You, you will not be able to, to make the, the, the Hamiltonian please. They will not, the ground states will not be easy to find. And at some point, even if the temperature is very low, you will be rather in a spin glass phases. The long range order will not be there anymore. And what Nishimori did, and I will insist on this uh, later in the talk, he found a special, a special line in these uh, this, uh, two parameter spaces, uh, along which he managed to compute some thermodynamic quantities. So he, he found out that there is a specific line which I do not define in this slide. It will be defined in the slide just after for the XY model. And along this line, you notice that there are some miracles, some things it can uh, compute more easily than anywhere here or anywhere here. So let me uh, switch to a, a, a case with continuous symmetry. And I will introduce a disordered XY model for which the definition of the Nishimori line will be easy to, to see. And Christoph, in the previous uh, picture, the line, the Nishimori line does not pass through the spin glass phase? Uh, a good question. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I think nothing is really known about this. They know uh, ferromagnetic here, exponential decay here. Probably there are things known about a spin glass phase, but the whole phase diagram, I don't think there is anything precise known. There should be a, an interesting critical point over here, but again, nothing uh, exact known here. And this is in any dimension, right? Uh, true, uh, any dimension D greater or equal to two. Okay, and your picture now is for easing, but next slide is X, Y. Yes. Okay, thanks. And for the XY model, it will be uh, for any dimension D greater or equal to three. Okay, thanks. So in the next slide, we 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 have a we 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 want to de to design to to define a XY model where the spins live in the unit circle S one, but which will live in a in a quench disorder and. As before, the quench disorder will be an AID field on the edges of ZD, except now the, the, the AID disorder variables will be continuous variable in minus pi pi. And uh, I need to introduce a law on the disorder and I will call it rho u. And u uh, will be in correspondence with the previous P with this formula. So, for those who, are, uh, who know the FK model, this is a bit the same formula, but otherwise, never mind. Uh, when U increases, P increases. Okay, so U very large is like P very large in the previous slide. And indeed, if we look at this, uh, this uh, probability measure on the disorder, uh, it's the probability measure on minus pi pi, which is proportional to exponential U cosine of, of the angle. So when U is large, this is more or less a Dirac point mass at the angle zero. So U large means the disorder is almost this deterministic field of zero angles on each of the edges. And if, is, if this is basically zero everywhere, then you can remove it. And your uh, quenched uh, Gibbs measure is the same as the XY model we had before. So U large, is P equals one in this diagram is just to match with the previous case. And U large, it's exactly the XY model we, we had uh, the first slide. And so this in dimension D uh, greater or equal to three is known to undergo a phase transition from long range order to exponential decay. And for, for, the, for the low temperature phase, you can use, as I said earlier, either reflection positivity or maybe Balaban, but this would be an overkill. 
or you could rely on the fact that the group is abelian and, and goes through Fourier analysis. Okay, so now when u gets smaller, when p gets smaller, then you start having more disorder on the edges, which will create more frustrations. And maybe I can make one uh, remark here at that stage, which is imagine that omega ij is not an id field, but is a one form which comes from a zero form. Imagine omega ij is equal to phi j minus phi i everywhere. If this was the case, if, if this uh, one form is, a, is, a, is a exact, then it's easy to see by change of variable that your model will be the same as an XY model by shifting the theta i and theta j. So the frustrations, they come exactly when the omega ij along plaquettes uh, cannot be solved by a, by a zero form behind. And typically, if, if this is an ID field, there is no chance you will, you will have the differential of a zero form here. So you will do create many frustrations and the ground state is hard to, to understand. And in, with those notations, the Nishimori line, um, is defined exactly as the line in this plane, which corresponds to setting u equals beta. And the, the reason for that is if u is equal to beta here, uh, later on, we will have uh, the same structure on the disorder than what we will see on the Gibbs measure. The, temp the same parameter will, will penalize the disorder and the way the angles will, will want to be uh, aligned to, with respect to each other. So this special parameter u equals beta will play an important role uh, later. Are there questions on the, on the definition of the quench disorder? So in those cases, I first sample an ID field omega and given this ID field, I sample uh, um, uh, spins on each of the, of the vertices according to this quenched quality measure, quench being, I think of omega as being frozen after it has been sampled. No questions? Okay, so the, the last one I want to define um, is going to be exactly the same uh, as for the XY model, but for the Lie group case. So now again, I will have an ID disorder which will live on the edges, but the disorder will live in the, in the Lie group G. I will still denote by little omega the, the, the whole quenched disorder. And on each uh, edges IJ, on each such edge here, I sample a Lie group valued matrix omega IJ according to a rho U low, which is a little bit like before. It's not the exponential u cosine of the angle. There is no cosine anymore. It's, it's a more generally group. But I again take exponential u real part of the trace of this uh, matrix here. And the effect of this is if u is very small, if the, is, is very, very small, then the disorder is basically the R measure on the Lie group. So it's completely disordered. And if u is huge, uh, then if you look at it uh, here, you will put more weight on the identity of the Lie group on the identity matrix than on any other matrix. And this will tend to, to make the disorder concentrated. It will go to a Dirac point mass on the identity of the Lie group on the identity matrix. So again, U very large when P equals one minus exponential minus U when U or P is very large, the disorder is basically like the, the classical system and when you get smaller, you have more and more uh, frustration and disorder. So here again, uh, U equals infinity. This is the classical spin system with Lie group valued spins. Reflection positivity is more or less the only tool to, uh, to analyze those. And using that tool, it's known that there is long range order and then there is exponential decay. So now let me switch to the, to the, to the main result. So, so the, the, the work we did is highly inspired by a, a work which, uh, which appeared in uh, Bayesian Statistics by Albe Masoulier, Montanari, Sly, and uh, Srivastava a few years ago. 
And what they have shown is a, a property of group synchronization on grids. And I will tell you everything about this result uh, later. So this will be uh, one of the two main ingredients of the, of the proof. And the theorem we, we can prove, which was uh, anticipated by, by them, is that if, if we take any Lie group G, uh, U1 for the XY model, uh, SU2, O3, and so on, then as soon as the dimension is uh, greater or equal to three, and as soon as the temperature is low enough, or as soon as the inverse temperature is large enough, then um, there is long range order uh, on the Nishimori line. So why are we on the Nishimori line? Is because the U here is equal to the beta, to the inverse temperature here. So along this line, we can show uh, at least for a while that there is long range order here. Okay, so on this line, it's reflection positivity and, and it needs to be only on Tori and things like that. And along this line, we can choose basically whatever domains and whatever uh, couple of points and uniformly in the domain and in the choice of points, we have that uh, the average quenched uh, two-point correlation function is large. And the fact it's uniform in the distance uh, gives you uh, even a quenched uh, a long range order result. So these two points, they can be anywhere, they could be old, but uh, okay, they, they should not be hidden here inside the fjord and the other one inside the fjord, otherwise it would not be correct. So it, it cannot be completely, um, I mean, they, they, they need to have some space around them in order uh, for this result to hold and you shouldn't have a bottleneck between the two or things like that. Okay, so, so the, the, the main message is that by using a, a different techniques than reflection positivity, we can still have a, a long range order. And may, maybe I should also point out in, in this slide that once omega is given, this Gibbs measure still has a, a, a symmetry group, which is given by the Lie group G. So there is still, even though there is a quench disorder, if you rotate the spins by, uh, by, by G, by acting on the left, so you have to act on the left or on the right. You cannot act on both. Uh, okay, I would be on the blackboard, maybe I could do it. But there will be, uh, by acting on the right side by the Lie group uh, G, this whole system will remain invariant. So you still want to break or not a continuous symmetry group. Okay, so, and there is something quantitative here in the inverse temperature, but this is not as good as what reflection positivity would give, which instead would give something like constant over beta here. So it's slightly worse. Are there any questions on the, on the theorem? Don't, don't hesitate, I'm happy to. I had one quick question. The, the left side is a random variable, right? Because you uh, this, yeah, yes. Yeah, so good question. So here, uh, that that thing is meant as the 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 expectation of this uh, kind of a uh, spin at x color with spin at y. Except I'm not doing the classical Eisenberg model here. I will make a comment later. So this is like a quenched two point correlation function. And then I average this quenched uh, question function. I average it with respect to the disorder. Okay, so it's the annealed version. No, uh, I mean. Oh, okay. A anyway, fine. But you're averaging it, so it's a yes. Number. I'm averaging. So, so I guess if I if I would be doing a random work in quenched environment, this would be the annealed case. But for spin systems, this would not be called the annealed case uh, because in that case, there is a partition function that plays a role. Okay. And this would be called, I think, the averaged quench measure. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the, the proof, so it will be divided into two steps. The first one will be a, 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 a very interesting statistical problem on its own, which was, which was solved by Abe Masulier, Montanari, Sly, and Srivastava. Uh, and very interestingly, the probabilistic tool that they use is a, is a very nice theorem by, uh, by, uh, by Itai, uh, Pimentel, and Perez from 1998. Um, but uh, 
I don't ruin the suspense now. And the second ingredient will be uh, to use uh, the specificity of this uh, Nishimori line, because the result above can be stated without a special line. And uh, uh, we will see that along this line, we have a certain exact independence results. Um, in, in particular, the increments uh, under the average sequence measure will be exactly independent. So this will make, this will be able, uh, thanks to this lemma, we will be able to use the statistical reconstruction algorithm and extract the long range order. So let me first, uh, so now I can almost start from scratch for a while. This, the, 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 I, will, I will introduce a, a Bayesian statistical reconstruction problem. So imagine that, uh, that uh, this grid is a Z3 and imagine that uh, on each vertex of D3, you have, a, you have a matrix G of X. And maybe the best is to think of a SO3 because maybe you are, you, are, you, are, you are filming a sport action or something from different points in space. And you have cameras G uh, substrate X at each of these points in, in spaces. And the only knowledge that you have is a, uh, um, the, 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 the respective position of a camera at point I versus the camera at point J. So you know the mutual uh, orientation of the camera here and the camera here, which is given by this G I minus one J of J. And if you don't add any noise and you know all those uh, point to point mutual orientation, if you want to recover the orientation from a distant point X to a far away point Y, then it will be easy. This will be given by this formula. The mutual orientation between those two points, you take any pass gamma between those two and you multiply the J I K minus one, J I K plus one around those edges and things will cancel out and will give you exactly what you want. And this uh, statistical reconstruction problem is as follows. The data that you have at your disposal is this big uh, array of, of nearest neighbor uh, mutual orientations. But as in uh, Bayesian statistics, that it will be a bit uh, uh, noised. So each edge will have a, a bit of a mistake added to the, to the mutual displacement. And for example, and this will be uh, what will matter for us later, one can imagine that the noise is ID on each edge. And so the, 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 the data that you have is that the orientation between these two points, I and J, will not be quite what you would want, but you will also multiply this by your ID matrix omega IJ, which will be sampled, for example, according to the law that I introduced before. So now the parameter U tells you how much noise you put into the system. If U is equal to infinity, you have the exact information. There is no loss. And as U decreases, you add more and more noise to the system. If, if U is equal to zero, you multiply each edge by a, by a matrix uniform according to the R measure. So it basically means you have no information whatsoever when U is equal to zero. Okay, and so the, the, the goal is to, to give a statistical estimator to reconstruct this given the, the corrupted data here. And the theorem that Abbe et al uh, have proven is that uh, when the noise is low enough and when the dimension D is greater or equal to three, then you can recover efficiently, uniformly in the distance between X and Y, the mutual orientation between the camera at X and the camera at Y. And uh, if the noise is too high, then this side is easier. You cannot recover anything. Okay, so in the next few slides, I will give you the, the main steps of their proof. So, <clears throat> and I will, I will go uh, uh, very slowly. So <clears throat> if, you, if, if you're a statistician and, and you want to answer this uh, problem, what you're seeking for is a, is a statistical estimator. So I use the at uh, as in statistics, <clears throat> which will be a measurable function of the, the data that you're given. 
And given the slide before, a first natural attempt is to pick a pass gamma and to multiply over the edges of this pass all the co corrupted uh, increments along those edges. So again, if there was no noise, this would exactly give you the answer you, you want, but there is noise ID on each edge, so this, is, this will not quite work. And just to go step by step to the estimator that we will use in the end, the, 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 the problem with this first attempt is that it's not centered around the target that you want to, to recover. And in statistics, if it's not centered, sometimes it's good, but it's, it's, a, it's a bad sign. So let me average this statistical estimator with respect to the, to the disorder, to the noising procedure. So this means I'm taking the expectation of this product over the edges of those uh, noisy, uh, uh, noisy uh, uh, increments in the, in the Lie group G. And since those matrices are uh, independent, this is just the product of those things. And now I just have to compute what is the expectation of one random matrix for my noisy, noisy procedure. And here, so I recall that the probability measure that I'm using to, to add noise to the system is this uh, radon nicodym derivative with respect to the R measure. And this radon this, this probability measure is very symmetric around the, the identity element. So it's not hard to see by conjugation that the expectation of this is, uh, is uh, collinear with the identity matrix of the Lie group. For example, SO3, if you want uh, cameras oriented uh, in, in, in R3. So, so the expectation of this is lambda times the identity matrix. And uh, the higher U is, the more the, the noise is around, uh, is a Dirac point mass at the identity. So the higher lambda is. And the smaller U is, the smaller lambda is. Okay, so uh, little noise, you almost have lamb lambda equals one. Huge noise, uh, lambda would even be equal to zero if you have the R measure. So what you end up with, is that the expectation of your estimator when you average uh, over the noise is exactly what you want to recover, but it's not centered because you have this lambda to the power of the length of the pass. And if the pass is huge, well, you basically have a zero expectation. So this is not good. So the second attempt, it's not going to be great uh, either, but I just want to go step by step, is to renormalize the first ID at least in such a way that uh, things are well centered. So things are linear here. So once I, I renormalize by this weight, uh, it satisfies at least that uh, the estimator is centered around what you want to recover. But of course, if you do that, you will accumulate uh, uh, ID noise on each edge. And so the variance of this estimator is going to be enormous and it's not going to be efficient. So let us just compute the variance of this estimator because it will uh, start showing some structure. So, so for the variance, I need to, to use a, a certain norm on those matrices. And the convenient one here is the, this Frobenius theory norm. So I'm going to, to compute the expectation uh, average over the noise of the trace of my estimator times it's that's the same estimator, but the, the adjoint. So if I do it, I have this renormalization factor here with a two times the length of gamma. I have the product over the edges of my estimator here and the same product, but, uh, but with the adjoint here. So if I compute the adjoint will uh, reverse everything. And uh, for example, here I will have this term times the adjoint of it. So since these are in, a, in a SU2, SU3, SO3, whatever, those will exactly give the identity. This will be, uh, will factorize out this also and so on and so forth. And so for a given pass gamma, uh, all this expectation is in fact exactly identity of the Lie group. And I forgot the trace, there is a trace here. So this will, be, this will be deterministic. And so the variance, because lambda is strictly less than one when you put a little bit of noise, the variance is exponentially large in the Euclidean distance between the two points. So, well, this, this is not good. 
So of course, uh, we are probabilists, so we, we probably would do all the same. We would say, this is not good because we picked one pass. So of course, we, we, we should average uh, this estimator over many, many paths. And, and uh, uh, a good way to, to, to write it down is to pick a priority measure mu, uh, a priority measure on say directed paths which go from X all the way to Y. And now my uh, statistical estimator will be the same as before, but I will sum over all possible directed paths from X to Y with their weight according to this priority measure mu. And I will take the statistical estimator along that random path uh, sampled according to mu. So this is something which does leave into the, maybe not the, the Lie group, but at least the, 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 the end by end matrices, uh, if the Lie group is in the end by end matrices. By linearity, so now it's a linearity in the expectation and in this priority measure, it is still centered around what I want to recover. But the effect of this is going to reduce the variance. And at that stage, I think uh, what seems to be the, the, the best possible priority measure mu would be to take uh, the uniform measure over all directed paths that travel from X to Y. This is definitely what I would have picked, but it will not quite be the case. So let, let us compute. And that's, I think, where the surprise comes in. So here, if I compute the, the variance, or at least the, the second moment here of this Frobenius norm, so it's the same computation I, as before. I forgot everywhere that I am still taking the expectation according to the, to the noise. So it's the same computation as before, except now I, I, I uh, I have a random pass, so I, I, I will, uh, so as always with second moment, I will have a mu tensor mu, I will have a first pass gamma sampled according to this priority measure mu on pass and a second pass that will be uh, chosen independently from the first one. And I will have to compute the kind of this correlation between the pass gamma and the pass gamma prime. And if I do the same computation I, as before, so I have the first pass, which goes all the way to here, the second pass, which is here. But now I, I do not have um, as nice constellations as before. So let's see, this will cancel with that. And then I have those two matrices. And if they take the same edges, this matrix will be the same as this one with the, with the adjoint. So this will cancel out, this will cancel out. And then I will have this matrix for the first pass and this matrix for the second pass. These will not cancel out. This, there is no reason that this is the adjoint of this one. And so these, uh, the effect of this will be that this expectation around the noise will give a lambda factor for this one and another lambda factor for this one. And they will cancel out part of this renormalization here. So believe me, if you do it uh, correctly, you will have a lambda squared factor each time you will have a different edge on the pass gamma and the pass gamma prime. So this means that the second moment is exactly given by the uh, expectation for two independent pass gamma and gamma prime of one over lambda squared, the number of edges that are common to gamma and gamma prime. So the variance is given by the by the how much two random paths want to intersect each other. And so if you were to take the intuition I gave before, if you take two uniformly independent paths between X and Y, um, in fact, in dimension uh, four or bigger, this will work uh, very well. But in dimension three, it's, it, it doesn't work at all. And I think I would have faced this problem. I would probably, maybe have obtained a theorem in dimension four or bigger. And in dimension three, I would have been completely stuck. But there is this, uh, this uh, crazy theorem from uh, Benjamin Pimentel Perez, where they designed uh, exactly priority measures in, in, on, on directed paths in Z3 and, and more general settings, uh, which have this feature that this exponential moment here is finite. So what they built is a, they're called unpredictable, called unpredictable paths in dimension one. 
So th these are paths that uh, th they are uh, kind of nearest neighbor random MOOCs, but, uh, but they are not Markovian. And they tend to be unpredictable in the sense that given the first uh, n steps of your path, it's very hard for you to predict where it will want to go uh, k steps after. And so they designed a priority measure on such paths that are very unpredictable. And in dimension three, if you use the, the, the paths they built in two transverse directions, and they also did this in their work, it will have the effect to, to create very nice priority measures in Z3. And so Abe, uh, Montanari, Massoulier, et al, they, they relied on this theorem by Benjamin Lee, Pimentel, and Perez to prove group synchronization also in dimension three. Are there questions on, uh, on this? Did, did they prove a phase transition in the noise or just if the noise is too low or too, too high? So they, yes, they, they showed the, the full picture. They don't, uh, they don't spot the critical point or anything. Uh, they don't have uh, monotonicity either, but they show that if noise is uh, low enough, you can reconstruct. And if it is high enough, then you cannot. And for statistical uh, Gibbs measure later, it will correspond to uh, temperature is low enough, then you will have a long range order. And high enough, uh, you have exponential decay of correlation. And uh, in uh, D equals two, you, you can never do it. No, and uh, and uh, and in some sense, uh, so it's it's not uh, so no. So they prove that for d equals two, you cannot do it. And uh, and in the setting of this talk, if you were, if you, if if you were able to do it, it would imply a long range order for continuous spin system in dimension two, which by other means is not is known not to be the case. So in dimension two, it's impossible to to recover anything. Okay, so. I think this uh, uh, Benjamini pimentel Paris method only works for transitive, uh, for transient uh, uh, graphs. If, if you get these non-intersecting paths and you, the graph has to be transit, it's impossible yes. for it to be recurrent. Yeah, completely. But you could, you could imagine that maybe in dimension two, you could have relied on on a different yeah, yeah, yeah. construction algorithm, which, yeah. but indeed, that 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 uh, strategy here is uh, meant to fail in dimension two. But for example, so uh, if you go to dimension two plus epsilon, so it's transient, so it's still fine uh, from uh, your remark. But there was a paper by uh, I think uh, Mosel and Akström where they push this unpredictable path theorem all the way to dimension two plus epsilon. And so that means that uh, by using uh, uh, this uh, paper by uh, Akström and Mosel, uh, in the end with, with uh, Spencer, we also have long range order in a two plus epsilon dimensional lattice as a corollary of what they do. So the ingredients two, so, uh, uh, I will get uh, over time uh, rather soon. So maybe here I will uh, go too quickly. I will just quickly give you the flavor. So one important uh, ingredient is a, is a lemma that was proven by Nishimori for the random bond easing model on his Nishimori line. And then he has extended this to the case of Potts model. He didn't do it for those models, but it's it's something very, it didn't look at the independence of increments, but the, the proof is very much inspired by what he did. So we, we take observables uh, on, on different edges and we want to, to, to spot a factorization uh, under this, uh, um, this average quenched measure. And uh, the, the reason there is such a factorization in, in, in rough words is as follows. So we write down what, what, what this means. So this will be in the next slide. This is this huge expectation. So don't look too much at the details. But the, the, the key step is to do the following. Uh, it's called the gauge transformation. And it's reminiscent of a small remark I did earlier, which was that if the, the randomness as a kind of a, um, uh, arises from the, the, the discrete differential of a zero form, then 
you, you have basically the same system as a classical spin system. So here you want to, to, to use all the degrees of freedom that arise from the zero forms. And you want to do the, the following change of variable. You, 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 you fix a certain uh, zero form SI, which lives into the Lie group G. And uh, you will make a change of variable, which will be simultaneous on the spins and on the uh, disorder. So spins will be sent to rotated spins by this fixed uh, field SI. And these other matrices will be sent to this uh, kind of a, a cross correlation uh, uh, here, which will use the, the, one for, the zero format I and J. And okay, and the result of this is what? After this change of variable, the, 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 the numerator here uh, doesn't move. So this is preserved. Uh, this is preserved. This is preserved. The only thing which moves is what is hidden here in the law of the disorder. So the change of variable does affect the weight which chooses the random matrices omega ij. And now the key observation is that uh, you can average uh, with respect to the gauge transformation you use. So you can average out with respect to the product of R measure on each of these vertices i. And by averaging out, uh, this kills the denominator, the denominator here. So it looks a little bit like an annealed trick, but it's not exa exactly that. It's more of a gauge transformation. And the effect of this is that then you can average with respect to R measures what you have here, and it does create independence over the edges. And very roughly, so, how to use the, the statistical reconstruction from Abit Al and this uh, remark of, uh, uh, of uh, invariance of increments on edges for the average quench measure. What we want to understand is these two points correlation function. Instead, we, we stick in the reconstruction algorithm of Abit Al. So we argue as follows. We say that uh, um, uh, okay, so so let me let me let me show to you what is this expectation here. So by doing similar computations as, as what we did before, this is going to be centered exactly around what we want. This is going to be exactly given by that. So here I'm going way too fast, but this has the right. Uh, this has a, a nice expectation, and we conclude by uh, by saying that what we want is uh, what has a nice uh, expectation here plus a, a, a mistake. And now uh, by trace cauchy schwarz inequality, this, the statistical reconstruction operator here is going to be very close in L2 norm, in Frobenius norm to the identity. So this is going to be a, a very small in average quantity. And so this forces this to be very close to identity uh, matrix. I mean, to, to one because I took the trace. No. So the idea is when, when we are on the Nishimori line and we can rely on a lot of independence, the reconstruction algorithm detects long range order. And I will very, uh, do I still have a couple of minutes or? Ariel? Yeah, yeah you can take a few more minutes. So, so the, the last comments I want to make is that I, I, I uh, so everything I say the give, gives a long range order for the random bond XY model, also for the Lie group valued case, but, but you may wonder why I moved to the Lie group and didn't stick to the Eisenberg model, uh, which is the, the, the easiest and maybe nicest example of a, of a spin system with non-abelian continuous symmetry group. And the reason is that the, 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 the Eisenberg model lives on the sphere S2, and the S2 is not a Lie group. And this group synchronization of Abbe et al heavily relies on the fact we have uh, groups increments on edges. So if we want to get back to the, to the, to the classical spin ON model, where spins lives in the, in the unit sphere Sn minus uh, one, we can still, uh, uh, we can still define Nishimori lines so that the argument flows. 
But those Nishimori lines are less isotropic in a way, so they, they, we need to prescribe an axis along which we define a disorder. And the effect of that is that the, the, the quenched Gibbs measure doesn't have any more uh, continuous symmetry. So in that case, we cannot really say that we break a continuous symmetry. It's more of a discrete symmetry in that case, except uh, in a few cases. So if you take the spheres uh, Sn, there are only three cases where uh, the spheres Sn happens to be Lie groups themselves. It's the S0 sphere, which is a bit uh, of an overkill, the S1 sphere, and also the S3 sphere, which in this case is uh, isomorphic to the group SU2. And using this special feature, we can sort of recover a little bit of a underlying group structure. And I pass the details, but in that case, we can define yet another Nishimori line for this classical O4 model. So the O4 model is because the symmetry group here is O4. But the, the, the and here we can prove using the same uh, group synchronization technique, a continuous symmetry group, but interestingly, the symmetry group we break is not the full SO4, it's only half of it and corresponds to the, to the so-called left isoclinic rotation. So we can break half of the, of the, of the symmetry group uh, for spin systems that live in S3. Say S7, S7 has something like a group structure. Is there anything that can be done there? Oh, uh, Actually, I actually did not know that. So, so it's, a, it's a very good question. I don't know. Let me. You know, unit octonians. Unit octonians. Okay. Uh, a very good question. I, I don't know, but I would guess maybe uh, if I would know more about unit octonians. And if it fits well this framework, then there is a chance. Uh, at least a certain uh, subgroup with continuous symmetry will still be broken. Um, no, very good. I don't know. It, it's it's likely then. Thanks for the. I, I must admit that uh, I went on mass overflow to to check uh, which spheres do uh, happen to be Lie groups. And uh, and I found several references saying the only ones are S zero S one. S3 using cohomology of these, but if S, S7 in a, in, a, in a different sense is intimately related to a Lie group, then maybe it can still go through, I don't know. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, the, what fails is the associative law. So I suppose you, you may not get your nice cancellations. Oh yeah, if I lose associativity, then, uh, then it's probably uh, quite an issue, I, I expect. But but it's a good comment. I, I will I will uh, I will investigate. Maybe I ask too much axioms to mass overflow to conclude. It's possible. Um, okay. And the last comment, uh, but I, I will not go into it, is that uh, uh, so this is a, a work in progress, but which is a um, which which uh, which will be even shorter in a sense is to apply this whole idea to the setting of a lattice gauge theory. And what we can show in this case is uh, we can show a confining, decon maybe I'll skip directly to the CRM, a confining, deconfining uh, phase transition for the abelian lattice gauge theory in quenched disorder. So there is a disorder that lives on the plaquette, uh, which gives a different proof of, uh, of uh, confining, deconfining transition in the, I mean, there was no proof in the presence of disorder, but it's not a Fourier proof as it is when you don't have disorder here. And that proof only works in the abelian case as opposed to the rest of the talk whose main motivation was non-abelian symmetry. Here it only works in abelian for good reasons because otherwise it's conjectured to be wrong. And so we have this, uh, um, this deconfining phase at low temperature here. And in some sense, the tool is to use uh, uh, unpredictable surface theorems, which is a, a not very difficult extension of a Benjamini Pimentel pair. So we need to sample surfaces in such a way that they don't overlap too much. Uh, I'll end on this picture. Uh, okay, I don't have time for this, but I'll end on this picture. This was a 
picture I did for the ICMP this summer in Geneva. And, uh, and uh, I wanted to highlight this use of statistical reconstruction that I explained to you. And there was a, a second part, but I gave a talk in Tel Aviv last year about that, about another type of statistical reconstruction where the, 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 the information we lose is more deterministic in a way. And this one had to do with, uh, with the BKT transition. Okay, so, sorry, I'm a bit over time. Thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to take any question. Okay, hey, thank you, Christophe. Questions, Ron? Yes, I, I had a few questions. Thanks a lot, Christophe. Really interesting, very good work. Um, so uh, your talk was concerned with the uh, three-dimensional case and uh, can you shed any light on the Heisenberg model in two dimensions of the exponential decay, maybe along an Ishimori line? Um, no, uh, that I don't think uh, it's a good question. So, so okay. So the 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 way uh, Abe, Sly, and and prove that in dimension two you cannot uh, reconstruct anything in the case of a continuous symmetry group. That proof uh, is very similar, in essence, to the Mermin Wagner uh, uh, proof. So, so I don't think they, they put it this way, but uh, but but it's definitely going towards uh, uh, power low decay upper bounds and, and nothing like an exponential decay upper bound. And so I'm not sure I would have anything to say about uh, the specificity of being non-abelian here. Maybe I can say that if, if you are abelian, uh, uh, even though you cannot reconstruct, it would be tempting to use those techniques to say that there is a, a still a BKT transition uh, in dimension two for the XY case. Maybe, maybe this would be more feasible. But, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but even that with the present technique, I'm not sure because uh, because uh, because I cannot rely on any statistical reconstruction using pass or anything in dimension two. So the BKT here will be harder from that point of view. But you do have the independence, which you don't have for the usual uh, Heisenberg or Lie group. Uh, ah, the, that, that lemma two? Yes, maybe this directly you can use somehow. Uh, yeah, it's it's true that there is the in the yes, yeah, but that's true. But this independence also holds for the for the random x y, right? For which you would expect a BKT. So, right, I'm not sure how the independence in itself, yeah, be plugged into a proof that would always give exponential decay. Right. Um. Okay. Uh, another question I had. Uh, I hope you can ask another question. I, I'm, I didn't think this through, but I'm just wondering, in the, in the proof of BKT phase transition, so not what you were talking about, but rather the power load decay, Freulich and Spencer were also able to show the power load decay for a clock model at an intermediate temperature. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there is some kind of analog in three dimensions that maybe what you can get from a Pyre's argument for a clock model is not, not the truth in a sense, because it doesn't, uh, it only gets you very, very low temperature, but you expect long range order all the way to some very high temperature, I don't know, re reasonably high temperature. Do, do you have any comments on clock models? So uh, instead of, uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, uh. Only makes sense for XY type models. I don't know how to do it for a Lie group. You need like a lattice in the Lie group. Ah, so the first comment, I'm not sure it's a good comment, but if I were to do um, a clock model, so this is a model where the spins take their values in the in the e to the i uh, two pi over n. Uh, I mean the the, the discrete z yeah. over n z on the circle. So in that case. Uh, an Ishimori line will also exist for sure. And uh, I guess uh, the technique of this paper will say that there is 
it will give the boring side. It will say that there is a long range order, which would be provable by other means by using payers. No, but it then, could be proven by Pyre's argument for very low temperature. And here you might expect the actual long range order regime to be um, up to a much higher temperature. That doesn't depend on the number of spins of the clock, for instance. The Pyre's argument would deteriorate as you have more and more clock. Ah, okay, okay, I see what you mean, okay. Ah, that's a good point. Okay, that's a very good point. So you're saying probably, no, I think it, you, it's a good point. So indeed, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful remark. So this technique, I think, would give a long range order for the clock model uh, uniformly in the N, mm -hmm. is greater or equal to three for a small enough temperature. The, the bond would not deteriorate with N. Right, so that would be nice. I don't know if people, uh, probably it's, reflection positivity does it, but yeah, I think it's very nice. Yeah, um, reflection positivity would also do it indeed. But, yeah. uh, no, that's a good point. And, and maybe uh, for you, uh, Tom noticed that we can also add a random, uh, a random field to the points, uh, like a Nishimori line for the random field and the points, and we still have long range order. For, for what? For you, you said? So, so in, the, in the measure here, we could also add plus, uh, uh, I don't know, H times the sum over the neighboring sides of a cosine theta I minus a disorder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, if the disorder has the right low, uh, which would have to do with this H, the proof still goes through. So it still handles a random field model of these except the random field is not uh, ID like in eisenman ver or in your results. Yeah. And then as the temperature goes to zero, the, uh, the random field disappears like you had for your quench disorder here. Uh, uh, I, think, I think it would be more and more uh, oriented towards identity. I'm not sure, I would have to check. Ah. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll let somebody else ask questions. Well, it does does anything really happen at the Nishimori line, or is this just a tool for proofs? I mean, do, do the models behave differently? And ah, uh, no, know? yeah, good, good question. So, so. Um, I think at that stage, um, the, the, what should happen here should not be much different from what happens here. I mean, the, 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 it, it's more like a, a special line where one has more integrability properties to play with, but I'm not sure um, it singles out if you look at the systems uh, in this area of, of the parameter space. There are some things that are, uh, a bit intriguing. The, the, the specific heat doesn't have any singularity when you when you travel across this line, even though there should be a phase transition at some point. So there are some strange behaviors, but uh, but uh, but if you were to, to travel like that, I'm not sure you would see any phase transition or anything. So it's more it's more integrable. One can prove things more easily there, but. Uh, but clearly there is uh, some maybe nice work to do to extend things like in the easing case to a uh, open neighborhood. Or... So uh, I have a question. Um, could, where, how important is the lattice for this proof? Because you introduce noise, which is IID on the edges. So suppose I told you take an, uh, you know, a supercritical percolation cluster or something like that instead yeah, so, of the lattice. So I think if you take a supercritical uh, cluster where the P of the super is high enough, as long as you can, uh, you can uh, efficiently send your pass by avoiding the holes of your supercritical cluster, which I think you can when P is large enough, then it will work well. And uh, similarly, you could also do a long range version of this. This would work equally well. 
So you don't need uh, you don't need much on the lattice structure besides being able to do this Benjamini uh, Pimentel Perez result. Th that is important. You can also I didn't comment on this, but prescribe a Dirichlet boundary condition. But maybe to give you a flavor that you cannot do whatever you want, you cannot put a Dobrochin boundary condition, which would mean, uh, I don't know, spins in a plus identity here, a minus identity here, uh, and kind of spot an interface between the two. This you cannot do with those techniques. So it's flexible in terms of the graph, but not so flexible in terms of boundary conditions. But uh, but basically, from what I what I get from you is that the main thing is that you need these EIT paths that don't intersect much. Yes. So the lattice, the the, the you know the sub lattice has to be something very thick in a certain sense. Yes. Yes, completely. So, so maybe I, I said it too quickly at some point, but if you take the two plus epsilon lattices in dimension, uh, so you, you, you put a kind of cone like that in dimension three, um, then in this lattice, there will be long range order for those mm -hmm. systems. And if you were to use reflection positivity, it would be impossible because you could not reflect along any, any plane. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, same thing for for uh, so this net is much stronger because reflection positivity. As soon as you go from the torus, you kind of can't really do anything, even if you take out you know a few edges by you know, randomly like. Yeah. No, no, yeah, yeah, no. I think reflection positivity. You, you. Okay, maybe this is too much, but uh, I guess if you remove one edge, maybe you can still say something. But I'm, I'm not even sure. No, one edge maybe, but if you take out even even a zero density, you know, enough edges, but even zero, still zero density, you you, you know, of edges, you yes, still one, get stuck one with edge. You're probably fine just by uh, by cheating around, but indeed, yeah, uh, something very reasonable. You you cannot say anything. Yeah. It's okay, very... any more questions for Christophe? If uh, not, then uh, we can thank Christophe again. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, we meet again, I think, in uh, two weeks. Yes, uh, Christophe, I have some questions.